Um, the Committee on Economic Development and Tourism come to order if the clerk will call the roll. Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Liberty LeBeau? Chairman Pereira? Here. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Um, item one on the agenda is the yes, citizen input, if we have any. I have none. No citizen input. Item two on the agenda is the minutes of the September 16th meeting. There's a motion to accept. I make the motion to accept the minutes. Second. Back if you call the roll. Yes. Council Dion? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Council Liberty LeBeau and Chair Pereira. Yes. Item number three on the agenda uh, is an item that, that I actually filed and I'll read it. Whereas part of the 16,000 acre Southeast Massachusetts bioreserve is located in Fall River. And whereas the bioreserve is managed in a manner to preserve the functionality of its large scale ecosystem and promote biodiversity, conservation, water protection, scientific and educational and recreational opportunities. And whereas the city of Fall River has a total of 22 miles of hiking trails that are available for public use. Now therefore be it resolved that the Committee on Economic Development and Tourism convene with the city forester to discuss the amenities available at the Southeastern uh, Massachusetts Bioreserve. And we have with us today, Mike Lavasia, the forester and the Director of Community Utilities, Paul Furlan. If you wanna state your name um, and address for the record, Mr. Lavasia. Sure. My name is uh, Mike Leboss here. I'm the city's uh, watershed forester. Uh, my address is 32 Pembroke Drive in North Dartmouth, Mass. Paul Furlan, the administrator of Community Utilities, uh, 383 Rochester Street in Fall River, Mass. Uh, thank you very much for having us uh, here, Councilor. You're welcome. Um, both Mr. Furlan and Mr. Labasia have uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and the reason that we're doing this is because I don't feel that all of the residents of Fall River uh, are aware of what we have in the bioreserve as far as hiking trails. And given the fact, especially now with COVID, people are looking for things to do that is safe and families want to get out and get out into the open air. I know now we're going into colder weather, but um, sometimes people like to trek through the snow all bundled up. So if you would like to provide your presentation to us, you may start. Yes, thank you very much. Again, uh, this was, uh, this was uh, started by a request from you, Councillor, um, for us to come in and kind of share what we have uh, in the, uh, the bioreserve. Um, the bioreserve was originally created uh, for the... Um, um, for both uh, Fall River, Freetown State Forest, uh, and other lands to, to come together uh, to create this area. Um, one thing that it does, you know, one thing that I, I want to remind you, so, uh, you know, I work for the Water Department. Mike LaBoss here is also, uh, works is the forester and project manager for the Water Department uh, as well. So the Water Department, we have, uh, we had our whole entire reservation um, on the other side of the North Wetupper Pond, uh, which uh, consisted of about 4,500 acres uh, when the bioreserve was started. Uh, that land was originally bought for protection of the watershed. Um, and, and that's what we, uh, that's what uh, the bioreserve helps us uh, keep it that way. Um, you know, some facts that some people don't know about the city, uh, but about 50% of the city uh, is either water uh, or forest land. Uh, our city is actually vast in size. The actually urban area of the city, it only makes up about 50% of the footprint of the city. Um, so we do have a lot of great opportunities up there. 
uh, but we do have some restrictions that we do like to keep in place um, for protection of our watershed uh, and our uh, you know pristinely good drinking water that we uh, that we have in this city. So uh, with that, we can uh, roll into the slide. Mike will uh, Mike is the uh, resident expert on this. He was uh, he was around when the bioreserve was started uh, when it was when it was talked about for many years. Um, so uh, Mike, well, thank thanks very much, uh, Councilor Pereira, for the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, and I'm I'm keenly excited about it because it's the bioreserves in a sense it's one of Fall River's best kept secrets and it really shouldn't be because it's public land and um, so much of it has opportunities uh, for people in all different facets and especially as you mentioned before during COVID a lot of people sought open space they sought big open places where they could uh, be away from folks and um, isolate and, uh, and and get exercise and, and uh, pursue some healthy things. Um, so what is a bioreserve? A bioreserve is a large land area. It's permanently protected from development and it's managed to ensure the long-term health of its natural resources. And part of that management in, involves restoration. Um, there are some parts of the, the uh, of, of, well, I'm getting ahead. Um, where is this bioreserve? Um, our bioreserve is starts at the east shore of Northwoods Upper Pond, so it isn't it isn't including uh, the the west shore. Um, it really starts at a at a line. I, I can see the cursor um, at a line somewhere at the top of Pond Swamp, and the bioreserve goes all the way north, um, well beyond Slab Ridge Road in Freetown, all the way up to Profile Rock. It goes to the northeast, all the way to Lakeville. The original footprint didn't include Lakeville. Now it does include Lakeville. And then um, the bioreserve extends to the east, well into Freetown up to Bullock Road, and then extends to the south into Dartmouth. You'll see, if you look at the map, I apologize for the scale. It's a, it's a big bioreserve, it's 16,000 acres. But if you look at the southeastern corner, uh, there's the town line of Dartmouth and you can see it clips the Copacut Reservoir. So we've got a bit of uh, protected land uh, and you know, part of the bioreserve exists in Dartmouth as well. City owns that portion. It's part of the city's water supply, watershed land. Uh, it's owned by the city. It's in the technical town of Dartmouth. So we're like any other uh, landowner in Dartmouth. Um, so who are our partners? Um, the bioreserve is 16,000 acres. Um, we, uh, we became a part of the bioreserve with, with uh, about 5,000 acres. Um, the trustees of reservations, they're, they're a partner, they're a private nonprofit. Um, Mass Wildlife uh, and the Department of Conservation and Recreation um, are also partners. Uh, you'll know uh, DCR is the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, they're familiar to Fall River. They're the Freetown State Forest, they're Heritage State Park. Uh, they're the ice rink, and uh, even Mass Wildlife is familiar because Dave's uh, Dave's Beach and uh, Cook Pond uh, both uh, are both uh, properties administered um, or owned by uh, Mass Wildlife. So most of the, the two state partners were familiar to us. The trustees not so familiar. Um, so why was the why was the bar reserve created? Really is uh, is is one of the key questions. Uh, bar reserve. The idea of the bioreserve uh, came about around two, in the year 2000. Part of, uh, part of the, um, the catalyst for the idea of the bioreserve was, was need. Uh, economic development kind of drove the idea that the city needed to expand, and, and, and we'll see a, um, a, a map of this later, but the city needed more land for economic development growth. Um, that became, uh, uh, um, you know, that, that we now know of that area is the biotech park. Um, timing, um, the idea of a bioreserve um, kind of percolated through the 60s and 70s uh, uh, and then up in, in the 90s, um, Harvard School of Design actually did a project where they looked at the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, they determined that um, this was this, the biosphere, some people, actually, in fact, some people actually call the bioreserve the biosphere. It's, it's a misnomer. It's really not a biosphere. 
But the idea, again, came out of targeting or identifying an area in size large enough that would sustain uh, the native flora and fauna of this area, of this region. And so, um, or, or of a region, um, the Harvard School of Design determined that there were 14 areas across the state, including uh, Mass Military, Miles Standish State Forest, the Quabbin Reservoir, and identify these areas that could that could be these bioreserves. Um, so that was that was that was at a at a point where um, top state officials, you know, got that study. We're mulling that over. Um, funding for it came out of the open space bond bill that was kind of new back in the late 90s. Um, uh, and then there was also a campaign. $11 million actually came out of the open space bond bill and, and, and $2 million came from the, the campaign. And there were willing partners. Um, the bioreserve creation involved 3,800 acres in Fall River and Freetown that were privately owned, that were contiguous, that were forest land, and that were um, under heavy development pressure. And um, so all, all owned by one owner, it was, it was the Hawes family, the Kushnet Sawmills. Um, so uh, not only was it one owner, which makes the negotiation uh, much more convenient, um, but they were willing, they were, they were willing to consider the, the sale of this land for conservation. There were sawmill company, um, a sawmill family, they have you know, ties to conservation. You also had a city and state agency um, that were interested in spending the open space bond money to, to um, advance their missions. And um, the private agencies uh, was pretty much the trustees of reservations who um, didn't really have roots in the local area, but was, was looking to do that. They were looking to, to uh, uh, initiate you know, urban um, environmental education programming and some other um, initiatives that they had. And then the final, the final um, aspect is environmental advocacy. And again, that was provided by Buzz's Bay Coalition who kind of brought these partners together. Um, a good part of the bioreserve is in the Buzzards Bay. The Buzzards, the, um, the bioreserve actually splits over two watersheds, the Taunton River and the Buzzards Bay watershed. Most of the Copacut, well, all of the Copacut is in the Buzzards Bay watershed. The Copacut drains toward the West Branch of the, um, the Westport River. I mean, the East Branch of the Westport River. And, um, and also Green Futures was involved at that point. So um, those, so the, the bioreserve was, was created because of really a once in a generation or, or once in a century uh, alignment of all these different things. Um, so um, what was accomplished with this bioreserve? Um, the first you know, big accomplishment was the creation of the biotech park. It's had different iterations and different names. It's been called the uh, uh, maybe executive park or the life science park. Um, but this bioreserve, the combination of, um, of economic development and conservation allowed 300 acres to actually be cleaved off of the Freetown State Forest. Um, the Freetown State Forest is, is, is protected land. It's quite large, and, um, but it's not sort of available for development. So it really needed a big idea and um, a, a partnership and a, and a, and a real sort of unity of conservation uh, interests to agree that the trade was worth it. And it was kind of a trade-off. Um, the 300 acre um, was, pri is pro was prime is prime developable land. Um, it's in the process of being developed. Some of it already has been. Amazon's up there and, and some other things. Um, also allowed, what was accomplished was the construction of exit 8B. And, you know, uh, folks remember that was, uh, that was not an easy, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that took some time, but that actually got accomplished. And so it gave access to the biotech park right off 24, just beautiful access. 3,800 acres of forest land was newly protected. So the entire um, Acushnet Sawmills Fall River holding and a lot of the Freetown holding um, was acquired by the state uh, and by the a little bit by the trustees. I'll, I'll show you later. And then, of course, the 2,800 acres of water department land uh, from the east shore of the Northwoods Upper Pond 
um, <clears throat> to the Copacut Reservoir and, and beyond was now all open for public access. And honestly, that was something that hadn't happened for a hundred years. Um, the land, you know, uh, over time, uh, you know, the Watupper Reservation um, was kind of sealed up. I mean, you know, it wasn't open for, it wasn't open for legal activities. Things happened out there, we all know, but, um, uh, you know, the policy was no, no recreation on the, on the Watupper Reservation. But the Watupper Reservation had a big footprint. It was, it was uh, a notable conservation parcel. I mean, the city, the city was so ahead of its time in the 18, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, was so ahead of its time um, to uh, protect the water supply. You know, what a, uh, what a blessing it is that the, that the water supply itself is within the town. You know, other towns have great water supplies, New Bedford, for example, but New Bedford's water supply is in Rochester, Lakeville, and Middleborough, and 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 Roch, um, and, you know, out of out of the town, and and so the unique thing that Fall River has is uh, um, its own water resources within the town. So that's that's great. Um, in well, 1870, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yep. Nope. So the, so what we're going to do now is just kind of take you through a little uh, background of how uh, you know this, the Fall River Water Department. That has gained some of the land that it's that it has uh, for protection of the water supply. Um, you know, it started in the uh, to be truthful, started in the 1800s. Uh, the waterworks began in 1870. That's when uh, the uh, Fort River Water Department was uh, created. The original pump station was built on the North Watupper in 1873. Uh, it started out with the Bedford Street uh, area. Where we purchased 40 acres, the water department for the pump station. Uh, from there, shoreline parcels were acquired, uh, as well as other parcels throughout the whole entire area. Uh, the Narrows Gatehouse, which is the uh, small granite building on the side of 195 or the 24 uh, off ramp off of 195, uh, was constructed in 1908 to keep the north and south with Tupper separate. Uh, intercepted drains so that uh, large area that was cleared about uh, a couple of years ago uh, on the side of Route 24. Uh, that's uh, the intercepted drain that stops any drainage coming from the city down into the North Watupper Pond that was constructed in 1916. And some of the research that we did uh, looking looking back at this, um, you know, the North Watupper Pond uh, before this time back in the early 1800s was used for recreational purposes. Uh, once it was identified as a drinking water supply, that was uh, stopped. Uh, even as far as ice harvesting, they used to do a lot of ice harvesting, which would go into drinking water or be used in ice boxes back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and hot ice harvesting permits were cut off as uh, early as 1915. Uh, that's when the uh, State Department of Health uh, told us to, uh, told the city not to issue any more ice cutting ice harvesting permits, as well as other restrictions were put in that whole area. Um, Mike, you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, some of these uh, land parcel maps? Yeah, so we can, we'll, we'll um, snap through these quickly and, you know, uh, happy to talk at other times about more specifics, but this is a, this is a snapshot of the 1928 um, Watupper Reservation. Um, and, and by now, um, you know, the Watupa headquarters on Blossom Road was established and all these parcels, these individual parcels that you can see all this geometry, all these different polygons. These were all parcels that were bought individually from farmers, from farm families, from woods people, um, from, from um, you know, different landowners. Um, and other than the shoreline parcels, which were condemned, uh, and basically the city took the shoreline sort of south of um, south of New Boston Road. All these parcels were, were acquired, um, you know, um, the fee was, was purchased from individuals. Um, but this shows, you can see all the parcels are numbered. Uh, the parcels were bought, you know, there was planning that was done. The parcels were identified after, after research as to what, what parcels were in the watershed itself. And the next slide will show you that in 1928, there's almost a, a um, there's almost a, a, um, a mirror opposite map of the parcels that the city owned. 
This is a planning map showing the parcels that the city, uh, and I quoted future consideration. This was actually in, in 28. Um, these were parcels that the city intended to acquire because these were all in the watershed of the Northwoods Upper Pond. You can see even these parcels were numbered. They were part of the, the plan and the, and the research. You can see on the right-hand side, I apologize for the poor quality, but on the right-hand side, you can see the red ink and the red ink just it, it has cross hatching and it shapes the parcels. So you can see in 28, um, the idea was to continue, but of course, 28, 30s, 40s, we had, uh, next slide, please. We had, you know, the depression, a war, and there wasn't an appetite and perhaps not even the funding to continue land conservation. So for about 40 years, land conservation um, uh, didn't cease, but it slowed down quite a lot and only occasionally happened when there was a, a real opportunity, uh, you know, maybe a, a gift or a tax taking or a, a, a special parcel. But in 1970, uh, with the with the Copacut Reservoir plan in place, uh, the city again began acquiring land. It, it acquired all the land that it constructed the, the reservoir on. So the reservoir, which is about 550 uh, acres in size, um, was 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 uh, constructed and you know flooded. We created the reservoir. We owned the land um, along the sides of the reservoir, the watershed land. Um, in 1988, the moratorium uh, occurred on the eastern section of the city, um, and land was rezoned from from in general uh, R80 R40 to R80, which is to say, the land um, zoning tightened, which would make development less. Um, you know, less of a threat because you know now the the, the zoning was uh, was was reduced, and then uh, that happened in uh, and then in 1997, and that's what this this um, this graphic is. This was the the city's first open space plan, and at the time, there weren't that many in the region uh, open space plans. Um, the city uh, got funded by the Buzzes Bay um, uh, project and um, working with Serpid. Um, actually has an open, uh, you know, get the open space plan done. And this open space plan is in some sense, the blueprint for where um, the um, watershed protection and the bioreserve protection really uh, comes from, right from this initial plan. Um, and in the year 2000, you can see just three years later, the bioreserve MOU came together. So in that short three year time span, um, all of those alignments we talked about early on happened and the parties you know, put together a memorandum, which took another couple of years to implement. Next slide. So um, for the city's part, again, it was the, it was the Watupper Reservation that really helped to anchor this bioreserve. Um, what the city, in, in terms of conservation, what the, what the city was going to um, benefit from was going to be um, better protection in the form of a conservation restriction. But part of that conservation was gonna identify areas where public access could occur. Uh, this exhibit, this is exhibit C from the, from the original conservation restriction. And um, you'll see that the, the land shown, and this is a very small scale. There's, there's thousands of acres of land. Um, you'll see to the west is, is um, Watupper, uh, Watupper Pond, North Watupper Pond. And on the east is Copacut Reservoir. You can see how the lands, A, A, B, and C zones are watershed lands. And those are those footprints represent all the city owned um, watershed lands. You'll see area A, which is in red, is no public access. And that's area in direct contact with the east shore of the, nor of the Northwoods Upper Pond. Areas B and C, both are open to public uh, passive recreation. So on the next slide, um, well, so a little bit about, I don't know, Paul, did you want to talk about the public health? Yeah, so a little bit, you know, Mike just talked about restricted areas and everybody knows that we have areas that we don't, uh, that are restricted to public access. That includes uh, the east and west shores of the, of the Watupa Pond, uh, the North Watupa Pond, um, the dam over at Copaca, uh, is a restricted access area. Um, and, and that's kind of following what's needed to keep our drinking water safe. Um, you know, water resources management, um, there's certain laws and regulations that we need to follow. 
um, up on the screen, American Water Works, uh, you know, all the way down to EPA, DEP, uh, and the Department of Health. Um, you know, originally when our watershed uh, and our reservation was created, there was no public access uh, within that. Uh, those look like those go back to regulations that were set by uh, DPH and the regulations. Um, what the what the bioreserve helped do, the generation of the bioreserve helped do, was lift those uh, those restrictions in certain areas. Um, again, there are still areas that we do keep restricted just because of the pollutants and stuff that public uh, can uh, can bring into there. Um, what we have is what's called kind of a dual barrier uh, strategy. <clears throat> so um, studies show that the recreation is one of the sev several non-point sources of pollutants that currently threaten the nation's surface water supplies. So it's not only us that's battling this, it's, it's around the nation um, with surface water supplies. Pollutants that can get in there would be anything from viral to bacteria, um, you know, uh, TSS, which is total suspended solid sediments, um, um, from erosion and stuff like that. Um, so two of the things that we do, the dual barrier would be the watershed protection. Uh, so that keeps a lot of that stuff out. Uh, and then also dis treatment and disinfection uh, is how we uh, make sure that our, our public health stays safe with the drinking water. Um, some of the forest benefits, some of the benefits that we get from uh, having the forest areas within the watershed uh, protects the uh, watershed from disease. So this is talking about the area of the bioreserve. So if you look at the bioreserve and Mike mentioned earlier, it falls into two watersheds, uh, both Monhope Bay and Buzzards Bay. Uh, Copacut Reservoir is in Buzzards Bay. Um, the uh, North Watupper Pond is in Monhope Bay. Um, a lot of the forest area and the floor of a reservation was all part of the watershed. So any water that falls within there eventually makes its way down to the North Watupper Pond. Um, anything on the city side, as I said earlier, too, we have the interceptor to drain that protects it. Um, so what we want to do with the forest, what it helps us do, it helps us protect the shorelines from storm, uh, sequesters any carbon or any impacts, um, uh, filters out contaminants, supports the environment, uh, you know, it acts as flood control if our ponds get too high. Um, so there are multiple things that the forest helps us helps us with. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about the history of the, uh, of the, of the uh, you know, how the bioreserve was created, how the, how the water department became part of it with the, with the lands that we have. Now we're gonna go into some of the uh, amenities and the recreational activities that we have available out in. Uh, we're gonna kind of stick to the Fall River uh, portion. We'll mention, uh, you know, other areas that are either in Freetown or owned by the trustees of the reservation. But again, in a future meeting, uh, if, if anybody would like, we'd be more than happy to come back. And I'm sure the other partners, uh, DCR, Fish and Game, and uh, the trustees of the reservation would be more than happy to come back uh, to discuss some of their properties and uh, what they have available on their properties. Right. Um, thank you, Paul. And thank you, counselors, for, for your patience to allow us to set, let, to set the foundation, because it's really Im important, I think, to have the scientific foundation for why we're protecting, um, uh, you know, so, so diligently trying to protect water quality. But this part, and I thank Paul for letting me do this fun part, because <laughs> the, the bioreserve um, really opened up opportunities that, you know, we who grew up in Fall River, we were never aware of it. And, and so I'm just gonna, you know, start by this first property, which was Tatapanam Trail. This was actually built in 1995, which preceded the Bayer Reserve. And um, at the time, Joe Rigo was, was, um, was in the water department. And this was um, kind of a, um, a pilot project, if you will. It was funded by, um, uh, a grant from the Forest Stewardship Foundation. And uh, you might remember Molten Metal, but they actually um, helped to, to create this as well. Pay for the signage, pay for the, you know, the creation of the trail. It's a mile long loop. Um, it's right off Wilson Road. Uh, parking is roadside. And um, there were a lot of lay, uh, naysayers in the 90s uh, that thought the worst. And I think it proved, the Tatapanam Trail proved to be a real success. It's got 
Um, it's got self-interpretive, uh, 25 self-interpretive signs and a, fl and a, 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 fl a flyer that you can, um, um, uh, you know, you can, you know, learn a little something about the trees and the other landmarks. Um, park by the road. And like most of the recreation trails in the bioreserve, it's open for hiking, for trail running, mountain biking, uh, cross country skiing, which we might be doing in a couple of days, and uh, snowshoeing. Um, so that's the Tatapanam Trail in 95. Um, once the um, once the bio was, once the um, open space plan was uh, was finished, we actually qualified for other grant funding. So um, the Millerbrook Conservation Area and the Quantipog Conservation Area were both acquired with self help funds. And um, um, Millerbrook is right across the street. It's the it's the the um, you can see the parking sign on the on the left in the in the in the in the graphic on the left. Um, that's got roadside parking. Um, that trail follows the Miller Brook. It's a it's a it's a beautiful little uh, uh, area that has a um, <clears throat> uh, old farm uh, stone walls and things like that, as well as uh, close to a brook, a babbling brook. It's really picturesque. And then Quantipog is um, is also a small trail. Um, on the next, and so those two. Um, those two were accomplished by 2002. Uh, the next slide will show you that in, um, in the next real, uh, you know, the next real acquisition that the city made, or it wasn't an acquisition, the next, uh, the next recreation sort of milestone was in 2009 when the conservation restriction that came about as a result of the Bioreserve MOU, um, when the conservation restriction was signed. Uh, from the moment that was signed, I think it was in January of 2009, from the moment that was signed, <laughs> like a switch, all this new land that was, uh, all this land that was in the Watupper Reservation, again, east, east of uh, Blossom Road, it became open. So it was important to um, get some mapping together. And so the bioreserve map was created um, in the, in, within that next year or so. And then and one, of the, one of the wayfinding uh, solutions that we employed was these uh, intersection markers. Anywhere where trails, uh, you know, a couple of trails come together, where there's a fork or a or a four-way intersection, there's a trail intersection marker that is on the unified trail map. Um, this is uh, one of our volunteers putting up a sign, and um, so um, I, I I believe you you do you both have um do the councilors have the maps? I believe they were distributed at another time. Um, but it's a it's a big like a road map, and it'll show um, the the many uh, intersection markers. It will also show where the six parking lots are for the city's land. And so um, you know, you, as as we've been looking at the um, at the maps, you you'll see the parking. Each each one of those areas we've looked at so far has parking. Um, parking is also allowed on public roads by lane gates where it's not expressly prohibited. And there aren't many places where it is expressly prohibited. The only thing we ask and, and the environmental police and forces don't park in front of an emergency gate. Um, and very seldom do people do that because it's uh, there's plenty of room to park otherwise. Um, and of course we have these unified trail maps which are recently updated. I think they were updated last year. They show some of the new properties that the city has acquired with the CPA funds. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's quite up to date. Um, on the next slide. Just on those trail maps too, if anybody needs one, uh, they can get them either from the water department office here at City Hall. Um, I always try to keep some up in the mayor's office as well. Uh, Michael, Mike Bostier also has them uh, out, at, uh, out at the reservation headquarters. Um, and we're looking to possibly set up a little kiosk, uh, an informational kiosk potentially to have it uh, down in the lobby at City Hall, so. There are numerous spots to be able to get that map. Right, I think there are some in, in on the rack and in, in the lobby. There's some at the state forest, um, different different places. Um, so, this homestead Brightman Homestead Loop is an example of um, a new trail system, a brand new one mile loop. Um, I call it the Bunny Loop. It's a great trail for beginners. There's a large parking area. It's right near reservation headquarters, so it's not it's not far from our operations center. And um, the trail loop itself, every tenth of a mile has a 
has a little bunny and uh, you know with with a with a tenth mile marker on it so especially good for for young uh, for for young children that can uh, can run ahead and and um, and uh, um, that's a, um, it's a nice flat easy to follow trail and um, little trail etiquette Paul you want to grab that yeah so we just wanted to talk a little bit about trail etiquette and um, you know what's expected uh, some tips and stuff uh, you know as uh, Mike mentioned we may be snowshoeing out there within uh, within a couple of days uh, we just want to make sure people are aware you know be prepared hug repellent um, for you know in the summer mosquitoes with West Nile also you know ticks um, proper footwear for the season hiking boots um, you know it's not it, they're not paved uh, uh, you are hiking through a forested area um, maps or trail apps so we mentioned the maps just a little while ago I know a lot of our trails are picked up on some uh, third-party trail applications that are available on for smartphones and stuff like that um, so you know a smart you can bring your phone uh, but one thing I was talking about with Mike when we were developing this PowerPoint is you know you can bring your phone but out there sometimes you might not want to plan on having a uh, uh, phone uh, ability to, to, you may want to make sure that you have a second means of uh, either your app or communication if needed. Uh, be aware of hunting season. So for most of these areas, besides a restricted area in Copacut Woods, all these, uh, all these are open for hunting. Um, if lost, just find the nearest fire lane, gate, or intersection marker. Um, police and fire do have copies of our maps, so they would be able to respond to those specific spots. Um, Mutt mitts, um, you know, dogs are restricted in a lot of areas. There are areas where they uh, are able to go, um, plus also roadway walking with your, uh, with your uh, dog is available. Just, you know, we always ask if anybody could pick up after their dog as with anywhere. Uh, prohibited, some of the things littering. So whatever you bring in with you, water bottles, snack bars, whatever, just make sure you bring it out with you, just whatever is left over. Um, you know, outdoor, uh, you know, we ask that uh, not uh, relieve themselves outdoors. Uh, fires, camping, um, those are all restricted within this area uh, due to uh, the high risk, the potential risk of forest fires. Uh, we did have a forest fire this past year uh, over next to Copaca. Um, we did get assistance from DCR um, in Fish and Game in uh, the Florida Fire Department. And that forest fire went on, I think, for a couple of weeks. Uh, they, they were battling it to be able to get the roots and everything else on, out underground. Uh, cutting trees and picking of greens or flowers are prohibited in the, in the bioreserve. Uh, metal detectors use. Um, removing stones. There are a lot of areas where you may say, oh, that's a beautiful stone. Um, that may have some, uh, some ancestral uh, value where uh, it was either a uh, burial ground or something like that. There are numbers of those uh, throughout the whole entire area. Motorized off-road off off vehicles. So um, dirt bikes, four wheels, uh, everything like that uh, cannot be used on any Fall River properties. Um, so Watupper Reservation and Copaca area amenities, another thing that we have over at the Copaca uh, Reservoir. So through the creation of the bioreserve, um, the Copaca Reservoir was opened up for shoreline fishing. Um, prior to that, there was no fishing allowed on the Copaca Reservoir. Uh, currently, you can uh, fish anywhere around the Copaca Reservoir uh, except off the dam. So the dam itself is a, is a prohibited area. Uh, that's an extremely large earthen dam um, that we, uh, it's a, uh, it's a high hazard dam classified from the Office of Dam Safety. Uh, it's something that we maintain and uh, we keep up on. Uh, we use that reservoir uh, currently for uh, supplementing the North Watupper Pond. Uh, but the Copacut Reservoir is about 550 acres. Uh, there's four different parking areas. You can see them on the map, and these are located on the. These are also identified on the bio uh, bio reserve map as well. Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about some of? Uh, is a question. Is yeah, if, you, if if I can, 
Yes. Oh, yes, without a doubt. Uh, all right. I'm I'm going back to the uh, hunting. <laughs> um, yep. Now, our trails are open during hunting season. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. So, hunting hunting occurs. We don't we don't close the trails. No state property or conservation land typically closes trails during hunting. Um, hunting is sort of this um, traditional outdoor sport that carries with it a kind of a pass. So it's up to the it's up to trail users to know when it's hunting season, and they're not excluded from um, um, conservation areas during hunting season. There are typically times that our, the hunters might be at dawn and dusk, and so during the day, um, there's likely no hunters out there. But pedestrian hiker, you know, hikers are cautioned to wear 500 square inches of um, high visibility orange just for safety's sake. Oh. So yeah. it is it is open. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm you know I went to school in Maine and I lived in Maine for a number of years, so I'm really familiar with the clothing and the hunting seasons, etc. And, uh, you know, I think when you live in the environment, you're much more aware of it. My concern is not everybody in, in this setting is as aware. So at the begin say at the beginning or opening of these trails, um, is there any signage that really alerts people to the fact that hunting season goes from this date to this date and anything that emphasizes, I, I mean, I get the fact that avid People, avid trail users probably are aware, but it's the ones who are occasional that that concern me. So, is there is there anything to um, help promote the fact that if you're going to walk this trail, you know you should be wearing orange, or that's something that a hunter is alerted to that they that's clear. It's a human being walking through the woods and not an animal. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Constant Dion, I'll, I'll be honest with you. You are, you found a chink in the armor. That's something we're not we 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 we're not um, currently doing. And I think especially you know with so many new people coming out to the woods, that's a great idea. And I think that's a that's something we'll we'll take home from this uh, meeting tonight. That we really should have at the trailheads and at other points of access or entry, just some kind of a, an alert during hunting season. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and again, you know, had it not been for my background in, in, in living in Maine, it probably wouldn't have occurred to me either. But um, you just become so acutely a, a, aware of it that when I saw it, it just, you know, the light bulb just went on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Paul, could I have the last slide for just a moment? So I, I wanted to point out that this, the map, um, I, I sometimes overplay it, but there's so much detail on this map and, and it really can be a useful tool. I just wanted to point out, not only are the parking lots um, you know, identified, of course, all the streets are labeled and many of the city's trails are labeled as well. Um, you'll notice that some of the trails have different line weights or even colors. And, um, and there's a key at the bottom of the map, and it'd be very useful to read the key and to know what all these things mean. Um, if you look at the parking lot, um, the, the MB14, I don't know if you can read it, but it's on the west shore of Copacut Reservoir. Um, that's, an, that's a trail intersection marker that's, that appears right at the roadside. And then below that, you'll see a lane which kind of leads to the shore of the, the, the reservoir, and that's got a little gate symbol. So there's a gate. So on this map, you can see there's a gate. Um, a heavier line trail might be a wider trail, like a fire lane, and a narrow one would be more like a single lane hiking trail. So this, and, and then the last thing I would also point out, if you look at the bottom of the Copacut Reservoir, the south bank, you'll see hatching. And the hatching is consistent with restricted areas. So you're not going to see a lot of hatching, but you are going to see um, that's a restricted area. So you can't get to the eastern side of the reservoir across the dam because that's a restricted area. There is another way to get to the eastern side of the reservoir from Flag Swamp Road in, uh, I'm sorry, in Collins Corner Road in Dartmouth through a property owned by the Dartmouth Natural Resources Trust. Um, we sort of have a, a, a little bit of a partnership with them and it's possible to you know, access that shore from Dartmouth. Last detail I'm gonna show on this map is that at the very top, you'll see Quantapog Road and it's checkered if it's checkered, 
that means don't take your Toyota Corolla down that road because it's not in great shape. Um, if it's checked, it means it's a, um, a, a road that's uh, a gravel road and it's really not that serviceable. Um, the other road symbols are asphalt roads and they're, and they're quite serviceable. Thank you. Um, just the short, the snapshot of this is hunting and trapping in all of its seasons is allowed on the Watupper Reservation from Blossom Road East. Um, that, that includes, um, you know, white-tailed deer, turkey, um, and even trapping, though I, I can't tell you the last time I saw anyone trapping animals. Um, the trapping may take place in the deepest swamps. Um, this person's uh, holding up a snowshoe here. Um, there were local uh, uh, animal uh, or rod and gun clubs that used to stock snowshoe here. Um, that's kind of tapering off due to some uh, legal changes and things like that, but we are open for that. Um, so the next section talks about different events and organized activities. Uh, you know, we, we've said it's a great secret, but you know, for those in the know, uh, people do use the, re the, the bioreserve and particularly the Watupper Reservation. And a lot of that's because we've been uh, accessible and available to assist people to find it, to facilitate their, you know, we're not, nece not necessarily to plan their event, but to facilitate it, to figure out how it, <clears throat> it, it you know, whether it's compatible. And um, sometimes we might uh, facilitate with environmental police or police detail <clears throat> or some kind of trail work that needs to be done in advance or so on. So we're just going to run through a few of these different things. Um, this year, this fall was the first time that the Forever United Way actually had their kick, uh, kickoff event in the Watupper Reservation. And um, typically they would have a single event with a lot of people, but they needed to socially distance, they needed some space. And so they had a terrific uh, run, walk, bicycle event that, last, that, that was spread out over four days. And it was a great, um, it was a great success. This is, this is the group, um, group of volunteers and participants on Wilson Road. Uh, the big walk, uh, a 12 mile or so hike, it's an all day affair. It usually circumnavigates uh, a different part of the bioreserve every year because 16,000 acres is really spread out and we're trying to show people different things. And um, the Watupper 10, 30, 50 K, this is the seventh, this would have been the seventh year, I believe that we've held that. Um, it gets, it, it can get as many as a hundred people. It, it's a registered event um, and um, 50K is a long distance. So it's, 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 uh, we've got the room to do it. Uh, Pascomancer Bird Club is, um, is out there just about every Tuesday looking at migratory birds and some residents. These are, these are American bald eagles um, that are nesting on the North Watupa Pond and they have for almost, uh, I think 10, 10 or 11 years. Um, so the, the Bird Club comes out there self-directed. Uh, the next slide we'll have Green, Green Futures that does uh, monthly hikes uh, of a different variety. The Copacut Rifle Association is, um, is, in, uh, is, is a, fully, um, uh, a, a fully organized um, organization that, 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 um, that has some events out at the, uh, the rifle range, which is north of the Quantapog, Quantapog Road. Um, and then of course we have a firewood cutting permit program, which, which uh, gets people into the woods. Um, other activities. Um, this this one's almost legendary. We've been we've we've started doing some history and education hikes. The Interlochen was one we did a couple of times last fall and had amazing response. Adirondack Lane. These are hikes that we've done with supervision in restricted areas. These are areas people typically, well, people cannot you know uh, access, um, but. We've, you know, through just basically volunteering on the weekends, we've put together with the help of some others, such as Bill Gonsolo from the Forever Historical Society, uh, to interpret some of the some of the interesting cultural history out there. Uh, Ice House, Spencer Borden Mansion Foundation, some other things. Um, we have a lot of trail running groups, and um, the trolley is a, is a sample of. Um, um, uh, the Espirito Santos uh, School has an annual spring trolley visit and tour. Uh, we'll get three or four 
uh, groups of, uh, you know, grade school students take a walk down to the pond, talk about water quality. Um, it's, and, you know, this, the, this, these are Flint kids who really um, haven't, haven't gotten out much in the woods, and it's a great experience for them. Um, then things go on that we, we don't even know necessarily. You know, people are out there, nature photography, geocaching, walking their dogs, of course, on the roadways, um, <clears throat> um, doing, uh, collecting uh, mushrooms and, and, and wild edibles. And this is a picture of um, some folks doing uh, tapping of trees. And, and this is a supervised activity, but um, these folks made some candies and maple syrup and, um, and, and some other things like that. Just thought, you know, this is not a commercial operation, but it's just a, more, more like an educational and uh, cultural phenomenon. Uh, I'm working right now with, uh, with Al Lehmer and the Historic Commission to identify notable historic uh, and um, and uh, natural features. For example, the Watupper Reservation complex itself is the original Blossom Farm that got started around the Revolutionary War in, in the 1700s. Um, and the picture on the top right is a cemetery. There's, there's at least a half a dozen rural cemeteries, some of which, um, you know, the, uh, the buried have been in, uh, reinterred, um, but uh, these rural cemeteries uh, are, are on different, um, uh, and, and, you know, different places and can be, uh, can be researched and um, investigated. Very quickly, the Trustees of Reservations, one of our bioreserve partners, they have about a little over 500 acres. It's near the intersection of Yellow, Town, Yellow Hill and Indian Town Roads. They have two parking lots, five miles of trails. They have what's called an ed shed, which is a little pavilion. It's, it's um, used for education uh, purposes, and but you could also have a picnic lunch there. Um, they have a, a beautiful restoration area. Their iconic sort of landscape is the Miller Lane, and it's this this property used to be the Miller Farm, and so there's just miles and miles and miles of stone walls and cellar holes, and it's um, it's culturally uh, culturally significant. Interestingly. On the east side of Yellow Hill Road, this 250 acres is a no hunting zone. So in the fall, when hunting is allowed everywhere else, this one 250 acre spot is the only place in the, in the entire bioreserve that's not restricted land that does not have hunting. So it's a great place. They also allow dog walking. So it's a great place and gets a lot of traffic, especially November, December, because people aren't you know, having to look over their shoulder, wondering if there's hunting going on in their vicinity. So that's the trustees. You can go on the trustees website to get more information about that. Um, very popular, there's a 16 car parking lot uh, on, on Indian Town Road. And then of course the Freetown State Forest, which I think most, a lot of people know about. And um, uh, this is a, the iconic profile of, uh, of, of, of the Indian at Profile Rock, um, which uh, as you all know, just a couple of years ago, this rock outcrop kind of collapsed and um, is no longer, is, is no longer, does not, no longer has that profile, I'll put it that way. There's still stones there, but there, um, there's, there's horseback riding allowed at the, in the Freetown State Forest. There is a dirt bike loop uh, in the State Forest, um, which there's a dirt bike parking lot on Bell, uh, Bell Rock Road. They have other attractions, the CCC Monument, Profile Rock, other things. Um, they have uh, different events. Fun Day in the Forest is, 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 um, is one they've had for many years. Um, and there are also mountain bike races. There's 50 mile mountain bike races that uh, start at the forest headquarters. Um, this, this, I think this might be the last section, but this is a sample of programs um, that were done when the bioreserve sort of first left the gate uh, and the trustees had a bigger um, 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 you know, participation in, in, um, in doing some of these things. Just to go through them quick, um, the, the summer conservation youth program was really successful and would have as many as um, a dozen um, high school age students working in the reservation and other places. There was a high school after school program uh, Vernal pool certification and water. This is a picture of water quality sampling, sampling in the Blossom Brook. Um, 
they uh, there were many more guided walks, bluebird nest box monitoring, um, uh, and um, they were working on some environmental education planning, for sort of a, a bigger, a bigger um, with a bigger arc of uh, activities. Um, amateur archaeological dig uh, was something that was supervised and sponsored. Animal tracking, um, great in the in the winter because of the tracks that are left in the uh, in the snow. Um, they had a volunteer program. They did have a, vo a 5K uh, road race. There were in programs, YMCA, Boys Club, Khmer uh, Family Resource Area, Summer Solstice. So this was just a sampling of some of the possibilities. And so really where I was hoping to end, uh, we were hoping to end our presentation was, um, so, so many activities have now opened, but yet there still is a, there's still a gap of um, understanding and knowledge and awareness that the bioreserve is there. It's, it's, it's why we're here tonight um, to share that with the council and, and the committee. And um, there's a lot of room um, to do more. And similar to the way that, you know, we, we look at the, 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 the city leaders of 150 years ago, having the foresight to, to, to protect some to protect so much of the water supply and the watershed lands. I think the challenge today is for us to, um, to, to be the heroes of today and figure out ways to, um, uh, to, to bring awareness, to get people out to this area, to enjoy it, to learn how to take care of it. So these are some ideas that are in the hopper and some ideas that really are being worked on. The biggest one really is the idea of building a bioreserve environmental education and discovery center. We've done a lot of preliminary work with Roger Williams University on concept. And um, we've identified at least one property that might be that center. Um, the CPA has shown great uh, interest in helping to fund that. So this is a property on Blossom Road. It's a farm this, and there could be an opportunity to acquire this farm acquire the buildings, adaptively reuse it, and to really have this be a launch pad for a lot of the kind of programming that we need to both orient new folks, get in the school systems, et cetera. The second idea is to connect the Quickishan River Rail Trail to the bioreserve. Um, I'm not saying there's a plan that we know how to do that yet, but um, it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of a natural to connect a recreation trail to a recreation area. It would have to go through Westport, but that's but there's some thoughts there. <clears throat> um, doing more self-interpretive trails, possibly with interactive apps, those, those kind of things are out there now. Um, more guided trails, using some of these third-party apps, um, such as All Trails uh, is one of the apps. Um, Map My Run is another one I use. Um, collaborate more with schools, and in particular, Durfee is lining up to have uh, an amazing, the new Durfee, uh, an amazing uh, biology lab and um, the ability to do um, raise brook trout. And you raise brook trout to release in wild brooks. We have that out in the bioreserve. Um, better transportation, that's always been one of the big uh, stumbling blocks of getting especially uh, children out there. Uh, maybe improving roads, there's information on that in the master plan. And then um, finally, the, the idea of ecotourism, of, of getting people out and cross promoting with, um, and, and this is really where your um, you know, in, uh, uh, economic development, your tourism, cross promoting with restaurants, craft breweries, hospitality industries, arts and history venues. When the trustees first opened Copacut Woods, at the end of the year, they did a survey and they found that visitors uh, were coming from 28 different communities. That was in the first year of the bioreserve, from 28 different communities, from at least three different states. And when the dust settles on this next wave of development and rail coming in and all of these things we're looking forward to, and um, it is going to come with a lot of development, we're going to find, I think Paul's giving me a hint, um, we're going to find that this bioreserve is going to be one of the last ecological areas standing, and it is going to be a natural draw. Um, it's, it's here for our residents to use now, but it's also a magnet for visitors. 
And so we really want to combine the best of what Fall River has in the outdoor realm with the best of what the city offers in the city through its, um, you know, through its local businesses, restaurants, et cetera. So with that, this is the finish line of the, of the, uh, of the What's Up race. And I thank you so much for your interest in this. And I hope that we can, you know, find loads of ways to cooperate and to really elevate uh, and, and put the city on the map for the foresight it had and for its, um, its interest in sharing this with others. Thank you very much, counselors. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Mike. And I thought the presentation, Mr. Frill and Mr. Labassia, was good. It gave us all a little bit of history of the water, the water department, how it became to be, and what things we have. Um, I know we talked about, as you were going through, lots of questions were popping up. Uh, one of them was the fire cutting permit program. You know, when can they do that? And is it Fall River residents first that have opportunity? And how do we get that out there? There just seems to be a gap between everything that you have out there and how we promote it. We have a city website, but it doesn't have any of the maps on it. And, you know, interactive maps, when you talked about having it hooked up to cell phones, I don't know about Mr. Frillin said that sometimes depending on where you are, cell phones don't work. I know that some people have taken out permits for cutting wood in its loggers, which you want residents to be able to do that first. The signage of where the parking is, it's difficult to see on those maps, but is there signage all around there? Is that something we could do? You know, between that, doing promotion with all the schools, Diamond, Durafee, Bishop Conley, Atlantis Charter School, all the other um, charter and public and private schools that we have, you know, where funding is low, they look for good field trips that are educational and fun. Um, you know, I would look to, to try to help you as, as this committee, try to help you to figure out what are ways to get this out there. You know, should we have a meeting and have Dawn Lewis come in from, um, you know, the IT department to see what IT could do to help promote it? So um, just one thing on that. Um, we are working currently, we just received a grant through MVP, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness. Uh, we're doing uh, a regional water interconnect study. But one of the things about that is actually uh, to do a, to develop a website for the bio reserve, uh, which will have our maps on it and stuff like that. Um, so this will be a page that'll be, be able to be linked to the city website. I, I expect that probably within six to eight months to be available. Okay. So, yeah, just, just to touch this a little bit. This is what you do all the time. And I know Mr. Labasi has been doing this for years and years and years and has loads of experience. Um, I know you, you talked about other groups that connect with you. Is it worth having them come forward and saying what their plans are, how you can interconnect with them? Um, because people don't know. I wouldn't know. I couldn't get in my car today and drive to one of these locations other than the one that's up in the, the reservation near the reservation house. Right. Um, yeah, other no, than that, I wouldn't know where to go. The one on Wilson is. Road. I don't know. You can park on the street, but I really, I mean, do we talk with Laura and try to get some signage done? You know, yep. how many signs would you need? That type of thing. Yeah, no, that's definitely something, you know, and something I did want to mention through this is that myself, Mike, we're all, we're water department employees, you know, uh, we're all supported by our rates. We're out there for our water shed protection and, um, you know, uh, the stewardship of our land. Uh, that's one of our major reasons right. for being out there. Um, you know, the recreational benefits uh, that come from that uh, is additional time, you know, taken uh out of Mike's day and his staff's day um, to be able to uh, assist in providing these and maintaining these. You know, something to do with that, again, is all uh, staff driven to be able to take Mike's crew away from their normal maintenance duties to be able to go and do, uh, you know, put in new trails and stuff like that. It's definitely something that's taxing on, on, uh, on you know, his normal duties that need to be done. Again, with the signage, you know, very good idea to be able to get additional signage out there. 
Uh, again, I think going through traffic or some other division would be uh, an excellent way to be able to uh, get those signs out there to be able to uh, put, put in. You know, Mike is always willing to be able to coordinate or work with any other groups or any other departments or organizations to try to, uh, to, try to make the area better. Again, as you said, Mike is the uh, resident expert out. So, so um, Councilor Pereira, hey, you, you may- uh, Dion has a question. Oh, um. Yeah, um, when you come up 79 and you're coming through that new section of road near WOW, that intersection near WOW, th there was supposed to be some type of, I believe, interactive map there. There's, there's a, uh, you, you know what the area that I'm talking about? Um, if you take a, if you take, you can't take a right, you can only, <laughs> you so can you only go, come up. What's yeah, so from, the bro so from the Broadway extension just south of Anawan Street, um, behind the gates of the city. That Correct. Yep. Correct. So um, I believe that was supposed to be some type of interactive map or kiosk or some form of thing to give people information. Was any of this incorporated in that or supposed to be? So the bioreserve was never incorporated into the, into that. That was uh, that was part of the Route 79 project. That uh, you're talking about the little uh, shed roof area that that's built Correct. next to the uh, next to the rocks and stuff. I believe that the state built that area out um, with uh, with the city's thought in mind of being able to put uh, informational stuff in there. Um, but. Right. I believe at the least they, it was, you know, connecting the downtown with the waterfront, et cetera. But it seems to me that would, that would be a great thing to do to add that to that. Um, I mean, certainly to connect the Quickshan Rail Trail would, would be a great idea with the waterfront being developed. I mean, you, it might help bring more tourism into the city because it's going to give people an, an additional option. I mean, can people right now come from Freetown through the trail into Fall River from Dartmouth into Fall River and vice versa? Uh, or is it not possible at this time? It is possible. Um, <clears throat> there, there, isn't, um, there isn't what you would say a, um, uh, you know, like the red trail, like you'd follow the red trail. Um, I, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to uh, Councilor Pereira. You, 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 list, you, you gave me like a punch list of eight questions, and I, and you know, the, almost every one of them would need to be um, uh, dissected a little bit. Um, so, and then, and it's funny because your comment really is not a not an unusual comment, which is this place is so large, you almost you almost don't know where to begin, and um, you know, it's hard to get oriented. Um, as far as the cutting permit goes, um, we haven't really publicized it because it's a tricky program to monitor and, uh, and to monitor because it's, um, but nonetheless, and it's, and it's driven by our need, not the public's need. So in other words, if there are areas that need some, some cutting, like dead trees, down trees, that kind of thing, um, but um, that's for both city residents and um, uh, and, and non-residents, um, there's no real priority. It's just kind of who, you know, who shows up. There, there has not been a lot of interest in it after the first couple of years and all the easy wood was cut. Um, so that's the way that stands. Um, as far as signage, um, we've been good. Uh, we, we've had good luck getting uh, some grant funding to have signs made. And if you've been out to some of the areas, you'll see we have really nice high quality signs. They were made by Baker Sign Company. And um, every parking lot has a, has a sign. So I'm, I'm not, I'm wondering whether maybe you're thinking some, some, some more distant sign uh, sort of directing people to us. Um, I don't think we have a good web presence. That's one problem. And I think there's an opportunity. Paul mentioned a grant coming up. If we could get better web presence. Um, there's, there's also some ways we could do some outreach, for example, maybe with the chamber. Um, maybe, you know, there, there could be some places where we could, um, the trustees had a full-time outreach and education person for a while. And that was why you saw all that busy work between 2004 and, 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 and 2016. That was, that was a large part of a staff person. And so that's, that's almost a communication and education role that we don't really have right now on our staff. So there's, those are some of the opportunity challenges. Well, I think that that's some of the things that this committee would like to help with. Perfect. How do we publicize it more? What do we do? And I don't mind, you know, sitting down with you, Mr. Lavassier, and 
continuing this discussion, tabling it, and perhaps continuing one issue at a time. How are we going to look at how we promote this? You have whites that just expanded. You have the hotel over by um, the old BKs on Airport Road that, you know, do we have pamphlets there? Do we have pamphlets at the Chamber of Commerce? You know, and I'm, I guess Battleship or whatever, would they come back? Is it worth getting a hold of our state reps for signage on the highway to direct people? Because I know that the state, we can't get signs like, we're trying to get signs to have people come off the highway and know where the Vietnam Memorial Wall is gonna be. And there's some issues there. So maybe we could work together with people. I, I have no problem you know, sitting down with you. I've seen the Eagles and been through the reservation because of my nephew, Philip. he loves the woods. And he doesn't get lost there. I would probably get lost. Um, He's so a good guy. I think if we tabled that, and maybe we can look at volunteers from colleges that want to get extra credits. Is there a way to do that, to have somebody get credits for helping us and, and working on things? I mean, I'm willing to work on it. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. I know we have a city council meeting coming up, so we have to uh, run short, but... Um, I would ask Councillor Dion and Councillor uh, LeBeau um, if somebody wanted to make a motion to table, we could certainly continue with that. Well, Councillor LeBeau lost her uh, connection. She just texted me. Um, and I would make the motion to table that we could discuss this uh, down further on down the road. I second the motion. On the motion to table, Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Liberty LeBeau? Chair Pereira. Yes. That is, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. On the motion to adjourn, Councillor Dion? Yes. Council Liberty Laveau, Chair Pereira. Yes. We are adjourned.